I'm going to give my um, production team a few notes and I'll read your bio and we'll go right into it. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Hi, Lisa. I'm here with Rob Oliver and I'm really excited to start, share, uh, start having him share his story. So I hope I got all my tongue tied out. So we're just going to dive into this. So three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Oh My Health, There Is Hope. I'm your host, Jana Short, and today I'm here with Rob Oliver. At the age of 21, Rob was involved in a body surfing injury, which left him paralyzed from the chest down with limited use of his arms and hands. This is his new reality, forced him to assess who he was a, as a person, how he was engaging with the world, and what was his path to success. Rob has learned the most valuable lessons come from the highest price, and that every day is a gift, so we get the most out of it by living with it, sorry, living it to the fullest. I'm just really touched by your story. I'm sorry. Um, I am really touched by your story, so I'm so glad you're here today to share it. Thank you for being here, Rob. Jenna, it is my privilege to be here, and I'm just so happy that you've asked me to come share. Well, I'm, you know what we do here. We share our story of hope. So I'm going to ask you to take as much time as you need to share that story with hope, because I know somebody out there is listening. And we really create seeds that are this huge ripple effect out into the world that we may not see the change we create, but I'm telling you it's happening. <laughs> Wonderful. So Jenna, I've got a, a story of hope that comes on four different levels. So I'm hoping that I don't talk your ear off and I'm hoping that your listeners will stick with me to the end. So you already started with kind of the pivot point of my life. I'm 21 years old. I'm active. I've got kind of, not exactly, but I've got the world by the tail, so to speak, and everything's going well. And then I'm on vacation. I'm body surfing, which is surfing without a surfboard. I'm riding a wave in towards the shore. Instead of it carrying me forward, it pushed me down. I heard something crunch. I felt a pop and then everything goes cold. So a friend of mine came, he, um, when I didn't stand up, he knew something was wrong. He came in after me. And this is what I'm kind of a little bit embarrassed to acknowledge. It was in 1993. And at that point in time, bright colors were in fashion. And so I owned a pair of purple swim trunks that literally saved my life. Because when my friend was looking for me in the murky water of the Outer Banks of North Carolina, what he saw was the bright purple came in and saved my life. What I, what I had happened from there I was transported, um, airlifted really, from the beach up to Norfolk General Hospital. It was touch and go as to whether or not I was gonna survive. But after like three or four days, I was able to come off of the ventilator and they were pretty sure I was, I was at least gonna make it for the time being. But the first person that I wanted to talk to was my girlfriend. She and I had been friends for a long time and we had been dating for about six months. And she was on the beach, saw what happened. And so when I was able to finally speak, I said, we've got to talk. And she came in and I told her, like, listen, I don't know exactly what the future holds, but it looks like it holds a lot of limitations. And if that's overwhelming for you, I care enough about you to say, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, please do that. And I said, I don't know what you're feeling towards me, but if you're feeling sorry for me, that's not what I'm looking for in a long-term relationship. I said, I don't know what kind of pressure you're feeling from other people. As to like, you can't leave him now. This is his hour of great need. I said, those people aren't a part of us. This is about you and me. And I said, really, right now, it's about you. Whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, please do that. And, and don't worry about anything else. I'll be all right. And she got really mad at me. And with tears in her eyes, she says to me, listen, what I love about you has nothing to do with whether or not you can walk. I love you for who you are on the inside. And if you think you can get rid of me that easy, you've got another thing coming. So I just, I, I will pause there to tell you, that yes, I married her. And uh, she is the love of my life. She is the most beautiful creature in all of God's creation. And uh, we, just in December of this past year, celebrated 25 years of marriage, okay? But I tell you that story for this one simple reason. What she taught me 
on that day is the foundational principle on which my entire understanding of living with a disability is founded. It is this, my physical condition does not define me. Who I am is defined by what's going on inside. It's my heart, it's my mind, it's my character, it's my, it's my faith, it's my sense of humor, as lousy and terrible as that might be, that's who I am. And my physical condition cannot and will not define me. And so with that understanding, living with a disability really, really kind of was not as much of a big deal to me. Now, I'm not saying it's not a big deal. Listen, there are days when it's just like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. And you know what's gonna happen? Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna wake up and it's gonna be the exact same miserable thing tomorrow as it was today. That, that, that is part of life. That is part of dealing with my, with my limitations. But I, honestly, John, I think everybody deals with limitations. Everybody deals with difficulties in life. And, and so many times, you know, you know that tomorrow when you wake up, it's going to be the same thing. There are people that have uh, disabilities or have conditions that are progressively worsening. And I can't imagine how difficult it is to wake up, you know, to spend every day and to know that, you know what, tomorrow, it, like today might be the high point and tomorrow may be worse. And, and so in that, whatever your condition is, this is the understanding. Who you are is not defined by gender, by skin color, by disability, by physical condition, by, by age, by anything. Who you are is, it's inside of you. It's your soul. It's your being. It's your character. That's who you really are. And that's what really gives you value. Uh, on a, just a quick side note, I... I do some, I wrote an anti-bullying book for kids. It's called Who Me? Yeah, You. And I, I get to go and I get to talk to kids about bullying and about the impact of it. And we do, you know, and I don't know, you've probably heard about the, the dollar bill exercise, right? Where you hold up a dollar and I get the kids to shout, you know, you're a quarter. Well, what's it worth now that we've called it a quarter? It's still worth a dollar. Because just because of what you call it doesn't change the value of it. And you can call it, a dime, you can call it worthless, but it's always worth a dollar because it is a dollar. In much the same way that I get someone to come up and you crumple the dollar bill up, and now that it's all crumpled up, what's it worth? It's still worth a dollar. It's not the physical condition that gives it the value. And uh, the last thing that I think is probably the most important thing that I share out of that is that when you have that crinkled up dollar bill, you get somebody to come and they I get them smooth it out as much as you can, right? And my, my point with them is no matter what you do, you're never going to be able to get that dollar bill back into its original condition. It's going to carry the marks from what happened to it for the rest of its life. But take that the next step. And the next step is if you have a dollar bill that's nice and crisp and clean and just came from the mint fresh off the presses, it looks beautiful. And you compare that to a dollar bill that has wrinkles and you know it's just earmarked and it's been through the mill which of them is prettier you might say that the unused dollar bill is prettier which of them has experience in the real world and knows what life is really all about it's the one that's earmarked it's the one that's been through the mill that's the dollar bill that has value and as a matter of fact just think about this that dollar bill that is all wrinkled and old and used has been valued at a dollar by many, many people. The first person that got it, well, they took it and they went, to the, they went to the store and they bought, let's just say, a soda with it, right? So it was worth a dollar to them. And the next person came in and they bought something and it was given as a dollar in change. And that dollar has been used over and over and over again. And every time it's used, it has been, the value of it has been appreciated by another person. And so, that value has been, or that dollar has been valued 50, 100, 200 times. And so in a, from a technical sense, that dollar actually have a, has a value of $200 because that's how people have seen it and how people have used it and how people have valued it. So no matter what your circumstances are, all I'm saying is sometimes the pretty people 
that look like that, whose lives are all perfect and in order and have never been through a single thing, uh, what they're missing out on is the true experience of what life is and the true experience of being valued by others. Uh, so that's one level. Am I allowed to keep going? Oh, yes. This is your show. <laughs> okay. So um, the next thing that happened with me was I, I'm, I'm in rehab and I'm learning how to kind of adjust to the new normal, so to speak. And I'm working with my occupational therapist and she says, what do you want to do? And I say, okay, listen, you'd know what the level of my injury is. And for anyone who's got a medical background, my neck is broken at the C5-6 level, which means that, um, as you mentioned in my intro, I'm paralyzed basically from the chest down and my arms, like I've got the use of my biceps, but not my triceps. And I use a lot of kind of counterbalance and I rely heavily on gravity to help me out with everything I do. But I, she says, what do you want to do? And I said, you know what I'm capable of. You tell me what the goals are and, and I'll work to accomplish those. And she said, no, you tell me what you want to do and I will work with you to accomplish that. You may not do it like you used to do it. You may not do it like everybody else does it. It may take a lot of determination, persistence, and creativity. But if you're willing to put in the effort, you can accomplish anything as long as you're willing to take it on that basis. And so that's something, again, my, the way that I interface with life was obviously extremely impacted by that statement. And I'm going to go over it again because I want your listeners to get this. You may not do it like you used to do it. You may not do it like everybody else does it. It may take a lot of determination, persistence, and creativity. But if you're willing to put in the effort, you can accomplish whatever it is that you want to accomplish. And so from that perspective, it really changed my entire mindset from an if mindset to a when mindset. It, so I was worried if I was going to be able to go back to school and complete my education. I was in the middle of college at the time. And now that became a when. It became, I went from if I was going to be able to drive to when am I going to be able to drive again. And all of the things I was wondering, am I going to be able to accomplish this? Now, instead of it, if I'm going to be able to do it, it became, okay, when am I going to be able to do this? So that was really huge. And, and um, that's, again, a key element to me is understanding that what we have to look at is each of us has a unique skill set. Each of us has a toolbox, so to speak. And we don't have the same tools as everybody else. We, you know, for somebody like me, I don't have the same tools that I used to have. But what it is, I've got tools in my toolbox. And what I need to do is learn how to use those to accomplish what I'm looking, whatever it is that I am looking to achieve. So my wife, my wife and I. We got married and she, well, obviously my wife and I got married. She can't be my wife unless we get married. But I went, went back to school. I was still in school. She had graduated. We got married and um, her, her deal with me was this. She said, listen, um, I am not going to carry your sorry backside for the rest of our lives. I expect you to go out there and you're going to take care of me. So she, what she said is, she was going to work while I went to school. And when I was done with school, she was going to work if she wanted to, but she was fully expecting for me to go out in the workforce and support our family, even though it was just two of us at that point. And that was a very important lesson for me from this perspective. And that is just because society may have lower expectations of me because I have a disability, just because, uh, you know, I've got some obstacles and some limitations. Here was a woman, and when she looked at me, she expected nothing less from me than my absolute very best. And I think that all of us need someone in our lives who is that accountability partner, who is willing to look at us and say, you know what, you can do more. You, you've got something to contribute. And um, I see the value in you. Let me just say this. I, um, again, I, I'll just tell you a, a quick story, okay? And that is, I remember there was a, a Mother's Day morning. I was in the hospital because I had a urinary tract infection. 
one of the side effects of my disability is I have been fighting with urinary tract infections since almost day one. And it was like the fourth or fifth urinary tract infection I had had within maybe a two year period. And they were bad. And that's why I ended up in the hospital because I needed to take IV antibiotics for it. They were just that miserable. I'm sitting in the hospital, I'm laying in my bed and no one has come to visit me. I'm just feeling absolutely low and abysmal. And I'm like, I try and take care of everybody else. I try and reach out to other people when they're sick. Why isn't anyone reaching out to me? And, and I don't, well, I'm a person of faith. And I'll tell you what, I felt like there was a voice that said to me, okay, so you're laying in a hospital. What is it that you can do? And I realized, you know what? I can call somebody else. I can reach out. This doesn't have to just be about me. So I, I called my aunt. She had never, she and her husband never had any kids, but she, they love kids. They're, they would have been fantastic parents. I don't know what the backstory is. I don't know why they never had kids, but I thought, I bet this is a really hard day for her. I called her. I left her a message. It just basically said, I love you. I know, I can't imagine that how hard this day is for you. And I, if I didn't get my mom, I would have picked you to be my mom. And that was it. I got a call back from her later that week that said, she was in tears and she said, no one has ever realized how difficult that day is. And the reason why you couldn't get a hold of me was because um, she and my uncle actually went camping and went where there was no cell reception because they just didn't want to hear from anybody and they wanted to get away from it all. And this was the first time anyone had reached out. And what I came to understand is this, that no matter what your skill set is, no matter what, you, what limitations you have, there is something that you have inside of you that you can reach out and be of service to others. And instead of focusing on myself, instead of focusing on my own needs, instead of focusing on you and why you aren't getting what you want and what you do, take it as an opportunity to reach out and support others. And in doing so, you build strong and lasting relationships. And that's three levels. The fourth level of my story of hope is this. My wife and I had been married for several years at, and she said, I, I, what about having some kids? I'm like, I don't know about this because like, what kind of dad am I going to be? I can't throw a football. I can't build a tree house. Like I can't do all of those classic red blooded American dad kind of things. And she said, well, what is it that a dad really does? Said, well, uh, she said, a dad loves his kids. A dad teaches his kids right and wrong. And a dad is there for his kids whenever they need him. And those are all things that you can do right where you are. I'm like, all right. I, I agree completely. So we decided to have kids and we, we had a lot of fun trying. And then um, it became less fun and more pressure. And it became like a science experiment. And you had to have all of the, everything in the exact order and at the right time and in the right phase of the, like just everything was, it was crazy. And nothing worked. It was getting very difficult. We went through, we got some medical help with this. We ended up doing in vitro. The first round didn't work. We did it again. I get a phone call from my wife that says we're pregnant. And I'm like, woo, this is awesome. We're going to have a baby. And she went for her first sonogram and she called me and said, um, guess what? There's two of them. And I'm like, we're going to have twins. This is totally awesome. She went for her next sonogram and they said, we, well, we've picked up a third heartbeat. And she called me and said, exactly that. And I was like, all right, stop the sonograms already. They're multiplying in there. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that I am the proud father of triplets. I've got a boy and two girls. They are 18 years old. And it, whenever I say that I have triplets, I kind of get an eye roll and like a God bless you kind of response. And my response is, yeah, he did. And these are our only kids. We don't know any better, but in, they're really an answer to prayer. They're a blessing because, you know, which of them would I, which of them would I give up? Obviously the answer is none of them. They are all equally beautiful and valuable. And, but it's all in how you look at things for a couple that was, you know, dying to have kids. We got three of them at once and um, they're, they're graduating. Uh, they graduated high school this year. I got two of them off to college. One's taken a gap year, but it's all in how you look at it rather than looking at it as, overwhelming um, work, which in some ways it was, you look at it as this is what we've been asking for. And this is the greatest blessing that we could receive. So uh, there are my, that, that's my story of hope on four different levels. I hope that it's something that speaks to the folks in your audience. 
Well, it definitely is something that'll speak to the folks in my audience. It also reminds me of Kyle Maynard. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. I have not. So Kyle Maynard was born an amputee. He had no arms, no legs. He climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. He um, played high school football, high school wrestling. He, to this day, he's a motivational speaker now. He goes out and tells people that mindset turning point for him because as parents, and like, I love that your wife was, she was like a, you got to get this done. This is how I expect things to be because- right you're normal. <laughs> well, his father was that way. And one day he was watching his mother and, and grandmother feeding him. And the father like slammed his hand down on the table and said, stop feeding him. He'll never figure it out. And they're like, well, what do you mean? He's got no arms. And there he's like, he'll figure it out or he'll go hungry. When he's hungry right. enough, he'll figure it out. And he's like, I remember thinking, cause I was old enough to be like, is he going to really let me starve? <laughs> But he said that was a mindset and he go, I can't even imagine how hard it would be as a parent to stand back and watch him struggle and struggle and struggle to get, which we all take, you know, so for granted, that's easy for us. Yet he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I could never do that and played football, college, not college, but high school football, high school wrestling. Like he was amazing. I loved his story. I love when I met him. And you remind me a lot of him because you didn't have those people who babied you, held you back, told you it's okay, you don't have to try. No, you do. Even your therapist was telling you, you could do anything. It may not look the same. It, it may be a little bit harder, but you can do whatever it is you want. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's actually, it's very interesting that you bring up his dad because my dad had a, a huge influence on me. And what I didn't know is that while I was struggling with my injury early on and trying to just get used to everything, he was probably struggling with it just as much, or if not more, because here he is, he's looking, his 21-year-old son who appears to just be on the verge of doing great things, now is experiencing major limitations. And my dad actually uh, had a story that he wrote, and the story, he called it The Master Builder, and his it was a real powerful story that has stuck with me to this day. He says, you know, Master Builder is creating a giant construction project. And there are all kinds of people working on it. And one day, uh, there's a young man who is there. He's working. He's learning how to use all of the tools in his box. It, he's got shiny tools, wonderful. And he shows up one day, and, and most of the tools in his box are missing. And he goes to the Master Builder, and he says, listen, we've had a theft. Somebody stole my tools. And the master builder says, actually, no, nobody stole your tools. It's quite the opposite. What I did was I selected the tools that I need you to learn how to use to do the work that I need you to do. You would not have been able to master all of the tools in your box. But what I'm giving you is tools that you are going to become a master craftsman with. And on top of that, you would not be able to do the precise work that I want you to do if you had all of the tools. And lastly, there are places that I want you to go that you would not be able to reach if you had a big heavy toolbox. So in that way, dad came to the understanding of like, all right, there's something that Rob's going to do that he's got, he might have a limited toolbox, so to speak, but he's going to learn how to use those tools to perfection. He's going to be able to do things at, and master the, as a craftsman. And he's going to be able to go places that he would not have been able to go before the injury. So that's, my dad had that same kind of outlook for me that says, okay, um, this is, we're not expecting anything less of you. And we're not willing to take anything less from you. Uh, go out there and, and use what you've got and make an impact. Well, I definitely want to talk about how you're creating that impact now. But I also want to just touch on the fact that you're real about your journey and you tell that you have those pity party days and it's okay. That's normal. That's natural for all of us to be like, why me? I'm angry. Or this is just, I'm exhausted. I have to do it again tomorrow. Like nothing's going to change. Right. It's okay to have those pity days. It's just not okay to live in pity land. <laughs> like it's a place you visit and you move on from very quickly. <laughs> I agree completely that listen, it is, it is impossible to go through life and, and to not have those days because you look around and you see that each of us has our own journey. Each of us has our own path that we are traveling down. And that 
journey has its limitations. It has its obstacles. It has its difficulties. And it's not anyone else's journey. And I actually came to realize this. Other people have been called on a far different journey than I have. And I couldn't handle what they have. So, for example, I, you know, I am a, I'm a motivational speaker as well. I go out there and I was doing a presentation for a medical group. And I found there were two women in the audience who had lost infants under the age of one. I thought, I, I love kids and I don't know how I would have been able to handle that type of loss. But that's not, where, that's not what I was called to do. That's not my journey. I respect them and I, I, I can empathize. I can't really understand where they come from because I haven't been there, but I can support them in that and understand that's their journey. And each of us has our own difficulty to face. But at the end of the day, we can't, the great basketball coach, John Wooden, said, nobody ever achieved greatness by focusing on what they can't do. It's take what you can do and make the most of it because that's all we've got. I love it. So tell us how you're showing up and changing the world with your, your story and what you're doing. So I've got a, a number of different things that I'm working on. I mentioned my speaking. It's, it's really a, a privilege to me to be able to go out and to be uh, to share that message that says everybody's got limitations, everybody has issues, everybody's got barriers and obstacles. But that's what makes us human. And what we need to do is to take what we have and to use that to make a positive impact. It is about, as I mentioned before, turning the focus from self to others. And I, it's... In some ways, I hate being a motivational speaker for this reason. Whenever I say I'm a motivational speaker, people immediately remember the Chris Farley skit with <laughs> him being Matt Foley and he lives in a van down by the river. And, you know, or you get this kind of stereotypical thing where people picture a motivational speaker, especially a motivational speaker with a disability, and their message is something along the lines of like, Look at all the amazing things that I'm able to accomplish, even though I have a disability. And you should be basically ashamed of yourself because you haven't accomplished diddly squat with your life and you're completely able-bodied. And, you know, it's, it's this shame and fear and guilt-driven mentality. I'm like, no, that's not what life's about. That's not how it operates. What I'm here to say is we're all the same in the fact that we've got limitations, okay? My wife, you would classify her as being, you know, able-bodied, Right. But she still calls me from the store when, when there's a sale and she needs help to figure out, you know, like what's 33% off of this price, right? Math isn't her strong point. I can do that. And she knows, call Rob, he's got that ability. And so in that way, all of us have um, limitations, all of us have issues, but all of, all of us also have strengths and we bring something in there. And then I take kind of what my experiences are and the areas that I have more expertise than I would like to. So for example, I do presentations to medical professionals about quality healthcare from a patient's perspective. I do presentations for human resource professionals about disability and employment from the potential employee's perspective. And then, you know, doing that general inspirational presentation that says, we all have problems, let's make the most of it. And then I've been able to take that I have written two autobiographical books. The first one was called Still Walking. The idea behind Still Walking is that life is a journey, and no matter what my limitations are, I'm still walking on that journey of life. A friend of mine said, like, does everything always work out for you? Are you always positive? Like, I, it seems like your life is charmed. And I'm like, okay, look at my life and tell me exactly how it's charmed. But I, I took it to heart, and I realized, you know what? I got to write another book. So I wrote it. The sequel is called Still Falling, and the concept is that just because you have a positive outlook and a good attitude and you're out there engaging the world, it doesn't keep you from tipping your wheelchair over in the middle of the street. This is what happens. It's part of life. And so th those are my two autobiographical books that just share my story. And uh, the second book in particular, uh, Still Falling, it's 20 lessons from 20 stories. So I tell stories about what happened in my life what I have learned from that and how I think it kind of applies to life in general. And then, so I, I'm speaking, I'm writing, 
I've got my own podcast. It's called Learning from Smart People. And I, you know, the idea there is to bring in experts and to learn from them to help me grow my business, grow my speaking, all of those things. And, and I'm a lifelong learner anyway, so I want to bring in people that I can learn from. Some of the folks I'm bringing in are what would be classified as everyday people, and I really enjoy the wisdom of everyday people. So, for example, I, a friend of mine has a son who has multiple allergies, and so she really had to kind of change her entire life, change the foods that were in the house, change the cleaning products that were in the house, all of these things she had to change. And she really had to adapt to what is the new normal. And yet at the same time, even though it's a new normal, she's still looking for the same milestones from her son. She's looking for him to meet those de developmental milestones. She's looking for him to walk and talk and to do all of these things. And he's excelling at those. And so just because he interfaces with the world in a slightly different way, and that he's eating different foods and that he can't have certain um, you know, chemicals around him doesn't change what is the basis of his humanity and it's to grow and develop and become independent. And that's what life's all about. So it's bringing in experts and everyday people and seeing how we can all learn from one another about what life truly is all about. Well, I have so enjoyed having you and you are literally the epitome of what this show is all about. It's about sharing your story and letting that be a beacon of light out into the world because it sends heartbeats of connection to people who can relate to little pieces of it and starts giving them those, those inspirational moments of hope. So I'm definitely going to get your book um, links and your podcast links because I know everybody's going to want to join you and read those books. And I don't think I have them. So I'm going to reach out to you and get them so we can put them in the show notes, but how can people connect with you? Sure. The easiest way is um, if you're looking for a motivational speaker, I am your motivational speaker. And so that's my website. It's yourmotivationalspeaker.com. Uh, the podcast is called Learning from Smart People. You can find it at learningfromsmartpeople.com or it's out there on iTunes and uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you can find podcasts, look it up, Learning from Smart People. And you know, glad to have any of your folks. You can find my books on Amazon. Um, and any way that you want to connect, um, I'm out there. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. I'm going to teach all of you a little trick. I hope my, my phone doesn't go off. But if you want to connect with Rob and listen to his podcast, I'm going to show you a little trick. You can go on your iPhone and say, hey, that name, <laughs> and just say subscribe to Rob Oliver, and it will pop up the podcast. And you just hit subscribe, and you become a subscriber, and you get to listen to all of his incredible shows. You know what? I never knew that before. Thank you for teaching me. I, you know, now I'm going to have to name your show Learning from Smart People because I've learned something from you. I love that. It's so easy to do. And I just tell people, just say my name. Just say, hey, subscribe to my name and it'll give it to you. So it works a lot easier. But thank you so much for being on the show. I really have enjoyed this. And the reason I got so emotional reading your intro isn't because of you going through what you did. It's because of you coming out to where you're at. And that always fills me with so much joy when I see that because not everybody has, everybody has the capability, but not everybody has that team behind them, you know, pushing them to that. And you are so fortunate to have that beautiful support team. You know, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Can I give you my closing thought for today? I would love it. Okay. Uh, whenever I do a presentation, and, you know, a lot of times they have me do a question and answer and I hate ending on a question and answer because it kind of like, okay, no more questions and I guess we're done. I always close with the thought for today. So here's your thought for today. Uh, the optimist and the pessimist talk about a glass as being half full or half empty. And in life, nobody has a glass that's exactly half full or half empty. You know, there are some people and they've got a glass and it's 90% full. And there's some people and they, they only have a little bit down in the bottom of the glass. The question becomes, where is your straw? And what I mean by that is, you know, some of those 90% people, their straw is just in the very top. And when they draw on that straw, they are consumed with what they don't have, what somebody else has. They're consumed with uh, how what they have isn't enough or it's not the latest, it's not the newest. There's, you know, and you also know there's some of those people and they don't have much, but they've got their straw jammed all the way down in there and they're gathering sustenance and joy and 
happiness and peace from what they have, not worried about what they don't have. And so as we go through life, the question isn't about how full or empty your glass is. The question is, where's your straw? Because the true essence of being at peace and having joy from what you've got comes from just putting that straw in there and, and making the most, not of what you're missing, but of what you have. That is a beautiful way to end the show. So thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.